Um, so now it's my pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Nabil Sheikh, who is a consultant cardiologist at Guys and St. Thomas's Hospital. Um, he specialises not only in cardiomyopathy, but has expertise in sports cardiology and effects of ethnicity on expression of cardiomyopathy. He's also worked in the CRI screening program at St. George's. We welcome Nabil and we look forward to listening to him talking about screening in ICC. Over to you, Nabil. OK, thank you. And, uh... Thanks for the introduction, Bethan. Um, thanks for inviting me here to give this talk today. Um, I'm just going to share my screen with everybody. Uh, okay, that should be it. Can everybody see my screen? Yeah, yeah. we can see it. Brilliant. OK, great. So we'll get started. So again, thanks for the introduction and for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, I'm going to give a very quick overview of screening in inherited cardiac conditions. Um, I'm aware that people, uh, some people may not be familiar with this topic in the audience. So I'm keeping things um, fairly simple on, on purpose. So to start with a few aims and objectives for my talk. So we're going to start by looking at what the principles behind screening are and why we do it. We'll then go on in turn to look at who to screen, how to screen and when to screen. And then I'll finally at the very end touch upon very briefly some ethical aspects related to screening. So to start with, why do we screen and what are the principles behind screening? So as most of you probably already know, um, screening is essentially the process of identifying asymptomatic people in an otherwise apparently healthy population who may nevertheless be at higher risk of a health condition. So the aim of it is to offer early treatment or intervention to individuals that may be affected and as a result ultimately lead to better health outcomes for some of the screened individuals. So a classic example of this is um, breast screening in women. So here we have our apparently healthy population of women aged between 50 and 71. We put them through our screening test, in this case a mammogram. This can be seen as a sieve that separates out those who have positive findings and therefore need further tests from those who are otherwise um, healthy and uh, have negative findings who need no further action at present. However, it has to be remembered that screening is not a one off process and as we'll see later on, it should be repeated. In inherited cardiac conditions, we perform a specific um, kind of screening named cas cascade familial screening. So this is specifically a method by which we identify people who may be affected by an inherited cardiac condition. And we do this by systematically testing the family members of an, inf uh, of an affected individual. And usually the family members tested are the first degree relatives, namely the immediate biological relatives, parents, siblings, and children of the affected person. It has to be remembered that screening is distinct from early diagnosis. So with screening, we are really talking about an asymptomatic population who are otherwise well, have no problems, from this disease perspective, this particular disease perspective at all. Whereas once somebody uh, develops symptoms, this is technically sort of early diagnosis. So with screening, we're, we're looking to find uh, otherwise healthy people who may have disease. So moving on to the question of who to screen. Now, before we look at the specifics of this, it has to be remembered that when we perform screening, we have to make sure that the condition that we're screening for is suitable. And the WHO have come up with a number of uh, different criteria that screening, um, screening programs should meet. So to start off with, the condition should be felt to be an important health problem. There should, of course, be an accepted treatment for patients who've got the disease, as well as the facilities for diagnosis uh, and management for these individuals. Ideally, there should be a recognisable latent or early symptomatic phase where we pick up individuals early enough so that we can actually modify their outcomes in a positive way. And of course, there should be a suitable test or examination for the condition in question, which is acceptable to the population. 
we've got to, of course, know the natural history of the condition. So there's no point in diagnosing somebody with a condition if we don't know what to do with them. So the natural history of a condition and its management should be well established. And similarly, it should be agreed, um, there should be agreed sort of guidelines and policies on who we should treat once somebody is uh, diagnosed with a condition. Of course, screening should be uh, economically sound. And as I've already alluded to, it should be seen as a continuous process and not just a, a one-off project. So having said that, who do we screen in inherited cardiac conditions? Well, usually, as I've already said, this is the first degree relatives of an infected individual, name, namely their parents, their siblings, and their children. Now, in some cases, we may screen second degree relatives or even third degree relatives as well. And I'll give you an example of this in a, in a short while. Before we go on to look at the examples, just a couple of very quick definitions. Again, I know that there are people in, in the audience that may not be completely familiar with uh, um, genetics and inherited cardiac conditions. So one of the things with inherited cardiac conditions is that most diseases are inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern. That's not the case for all of the conditions. Of course, some are autosomal recessive, some may be X-linked, but the vast majority are autosomal dominant. As you guys all know, um, we inherit one copy of our gene from our mother, one from our father. And with an autosomal dominant condition, the mutation in the gene needs to be present in only one copy of the gene to cause the disease. So this means that if an affected person with an autosomal dominant condition um, has children, the offspring have a 50% chance of inheriting the condition, assuming, of course, that their partner is not affected. And the second term I just want to introduce is what we call the proband. So the proband is the first person in a family who comes to medical attention. So having said that, let's go on to look at a couple of examples. So this is an example of cascade familial screening in somebody with an autosomal dominant condition, in this case, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So we have here the proband who is a 44 year old man who presented with syncope. He went on to have an ECG which showed widespread T wave inversion and as a result went on to have an echocardiogram which showed mid septal hypertrophy of 20 millimeters uh, and on the basis of this he was diagnosed with HCM. By convention on our family tree, um, affected members are shown in the darker or shaded colours, so in this case black, unaffected members uh, are, are normally shown in white. Now this uh, individual has two daughters and two sons, so familial um, screening was offered to these individuals and out of these um, one daughter and one son were found to be affected. Now the son himself had five children who were then offered screening and out of these two were found to be affected. So as we can see, as we cascade down from one generation to the next, we pick up um, more and more individuals. And this is the power of screening and hopefully early identification of these individuals can lead to better outcomes in them. Now, as I've mentioned, um, in some cases we may want to test a second degree relative. So this is an example. Here the proband is a woman with a autosomal dominant condition. She has three sons. We offer screening to two of them, uh, the first of which is cleared after screening, the second of which is found to be affected. Now unfortunately the third son has cancer and before he can be screened he passes away and no post-mortem is performed because the death is presumed to be due to cancer but this individual himself has got four children. So in this case, we would offer um, screening to the second degree relatives of the proband. In other words, uh, this lady's um, grandchildren. And when we did this, we found two individuals to be affected. So again, they can be offered early, early diagnosis and early treatment. So, so this is an example of where we may offer a second degree relative um, screening. Now, the, the person in question doesn't necessarily have to have uh, the first degree relative doesn't necessarily have to have died. Remember that some people may actually refuse to be screened or, or choose, I should say, choose not to be screened. And in that, in that case, their um, children would also be offered screening. 
So moving on to the question of how to screen, and this is actually quite specific to the condition that you're screening for. The general principle is to try and identify common phenotypic features of that condition by the use of simple non-invasive tests. And as all of you know, some of those commonly used tests in ICC include ECG, echocardiography, halter monitoring, exercise testing and cardiac MRI. And the vast majority of our screening is done um, using a combination of these tests, sometimes just the first two. Now, in terms of how to screen, I'm going to talk here about two common groups of inherited cardiac conditions, namely the cardiomyopathies and the ion channel disorders. These are the two groups of conditions we um, become, we uh, are um, frequently come across in ICC. Um, this list is not exhaustive. There are lots of other conditions that we may um, come across. Um, so, but let's take a look at the cardiomyopathies and iron channel disorders. So starting with dilated cardiomyopathy, um, usually screening uh, involves a 12 lead ECG and an echocardiogram. If any of those conditions, if any of those tests show some um, borderline changes, then we may want to perform a cardiac MRI scan. Similarly, with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we start off with a 12 lead ECG. Now, this is particularly powerful in HCM because 95% of people will have an abnormal ECG and often ECG changes predate the development of overt LVH or hypertrophy by um, sometimes up to a number of years. And again, of course, we want to perform some imaging, usually echocardiography. And again, if borderline changes are seen, then a cardiac MRI scan may be warranted. And finally, with arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, this is a bit more tricky to identify and requires, as anyone who's seen the task force criteria, requires a number of different investigations. We usually start off with a 12 lead ECG and then perform some form of imaging. Now, cardiac MRI scan these days is the gold standard, but usually we find that patients have already had an echo in clinic. We also want to perform a 24 hour halter monitor to look for uh, ventricular arrhythmias and, and the ventricular ectopic burden. And usually we also perform an exercise tolerance test to look for exercise induced arrhythmia. So those are the three common cardiomyopathies that we we'd perform screening in. Now, remember that the cardiomyopathies have variable age related penetrance. And as we'll see in a bit, um, this means that repeat screening needs to be performed. This is in contrast to the iron channel disorders, where usually a one off screening is enough. Turning to Brigada syndrome to start with, now usually we screen using a standard 12 lead ECG, and then usually we perform a high lead ECG with the leads V1 and V2 in the second or the th and or the third intercostal space. And this improves the uh, sensitivity for picking up the spontaneous type 1 Brigada pattern. If these are negative, we want to perform an adrenaline provocation test after careful counselling. And if all of this is negative, then usually screening does not need to be repeated. And with long QT syndrome and CPVT, screening is usually performed with a combination of ECG, exercise testing and halter monitoring. Um, exercise testing to look for paradoxical prolongation of the QT interval for long QT and uh, triggered ventricular arrhythmias, particularly bidirectional VT with CPVT. And again, if these are normal, we don't usually need to repeat screening. So moving on to the question as to when to screen, I've already mentioned that this occurs uh, at the time of first contact with the proband. But remember that if we go back to our principles of screening, we've already said that screening should be a continuous process. And this is particularly the case um, for the cardiomyopathies where screening is repeated after uh, set intervals depending on the age of the family member. As I've already said, uh, repeat screening is required for cardiomyopathies due to age-related age variable penetrance, but this is not the case for iron channel disorders. So in terms of when to screen, in general principles for cardiomyopathies, we screen first degree relatives um, one to two yearly between the ages of 10 to 20. If the phenotype has not emerged, then screening, the screening interval is usually increased to three yearly thereafter by um, up until the age of 50. 
and that by this time if the um, phenotype has not emerged then um, the screening interval is increased to five yearly up till the age of 60. Now it has to be remembered that these principles are not set in stone and you do have to uh, there is a there is a degree of flexibility so for example we know that some hcm mutations only present later on in life so you may want to vary your screening intervals according to this and if we look at international guidelines there is some variation in them as well the important thing to remember is to educate patients about warning symptoms to look out for in between screening intervals that should prompt them to seek earlier review a very quick word about genetic screening. If we have a family in which we know a definite pathogenic mutation causes the disease, we can uh, offer genetic testing for that specific mutation to first degree relatives. This is something that we term predictive genetic testing because it uses a genetic test in an otherwise well and completely asymptomatic person with no phenotype to predict the future risk of it, the disease in question. So if they're positive, we tell them that they will be at, they are at risk of developing the disease in question in future. And again, this should lead to early identify, identification of individuals and reduce their morbidity and mortality. Of course, remember that patients should be comprehensively counseled prior to genetic testing by a, a, a suitably qualified genetic counsellor. And finally, just to move on to look at some as ethical aspects of screening. So like everything in life, the benefits of screening have to be weighed up against the risks. Some risks of screening include false negatives. So we have to accept that we may not pick up every single, con every single individual with the condition being screened in question. In addition, um, false positives can also occur where um, certain changes are interpreted as pathological when in fact they're not. In terms of patient confidentiality, this is no different in inherited cardiac conditions than it is in any other aspect of medicine. These are the GMC principles. I'm not going to go through them in detail, but remember that in, our, in ICC we do carry quite sensitive data uh, about patients and it's important not to um, disclose this information uh, accidentally to family members in particular without the patient's consent. And finally, to end with, remember the principle of the right not to know. So a person definitely has a right not to know if he or she has a genetic disorder. I had a, a patient once in clinic who went through an ECG and echo, which were both positive for HCM. They came into the room and said to me, actually, I've changed my mind. I don't want to know the results of these tests. Now, if I told them this would have contravened the principle of non-maleficence and potentially cause them psychological harm. So we have to remember that screening is a choice and certainly not mandatory. And it's important to try and help first degree relatives to decide whether to undergo screening or not. Often we just send out an invite letter in the post. And it's important not to forget that some people may actually need help in deciding whether to undergo screening or not. So that's a very quick whistle stop tour of screening. Just to summarise, I've um, showed you the principles of familial screening and why we perform it. Um, I've shown you that screening is offered to those who are at higher, highest risk, in other words, first degree relatives. We've looked at how and when to perform screening and I've also touched upon some ethical aspects, but of course um, uh, the list is not exhaustive and, and there are other things you should know about as well. So I'll stop there. Happy to take any questions either now or in the uh, question and answer se session a bit later on. Nabil, thank you so much. It was a tall order trying to cover fa a familial screening in, in 20 minutes. So, um, but you did a really good job. Thank you. It was very interesting. You even managed to get some of those ethical aspects squeezed in there, which I think is really important. I will quickly ask you one quick question, if that's okay, mm -hmm. because I think it's really mm -hmm. important. Obviously, cascade screening is a massive part of what we do in um, cardiomyopathy clinics and ICC services. Um, what do you think are some of the main um, factors that prevent uptake in family screening? Yeah, so I think I think one of the things is um, following up. So, so often we send out letters and uh, I think it's important on every consultation with a pro band to ask them about family screening and, and have your family members undergone screening. So I think that's one thing. And, and sometimes we may, we may in a busy clinic forget to revisit that. 
I think the other thing is certainty and and you know being uh, you know first degree relatives not knowing enough about screening and, and the benefits uh, potentially of it as I alluded to in, in the last point I made um, I made um, you know we tend to send out these letters to patients but we don't really follow up in terms of the the first degree relatives nobody really in a, in a you know in a resource strapped system nobody really talks to them about you know what the yeah, pros and cons are it's, it's sort of it's, it's up to them to take it up or not take it up so I think that's that's one of the issues and then of course resources you know after every generation that are tested more and more people uh, come into the system and that's why we I think we need to also find um, other ways of screening so at, at Guy's and St Thomas's we've set up a, a, a sort of senior scientist led screening program so it's not relying just on consultants to mm -hmm. to do screenings lots of other people within the multidisciplinary team are, yeah. are, are more more than qualified to do it thank thank you Nabil thanks very much and looking forward to um going through some more of these questions in the panel discussion later on pleasure thank uh, you very much